to worship at First Christian Church. We are delighted that you're here today, those of you that are joining us in person, and I hope that I'm welcoming those who are worshiping with us online. We've had technical difficulties the last two weeks, and uh, the live stream has not worked, and uh, hopefully the recording uh, later in the day has. But uh, we, we hope and pray that today we got it all figured out. So we welcome you wherever you're worshiping today and wherever you're from, whoever you are. You are welcome in this community and you are welcome in God's family. Let us begin our worship as we listen to the morning prelude. to God sound in the heavens. Let our praise to God fill the earth. Let all God's angels offer praise and rejoicing. Let all God's creatures sing praise and joy. Open our hearts and spirits today. Let us praise the Lord today and always. In our opening hymn, all creatures of our God and King.
morning prayer. Gracious and holy God, we are grateful that you have called us together, drawing us from darkness to the glory of your life. May our spirits be the voice of the good news you have for us today. Open our hearts to your healing love, for we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Scripture this morning is John 13, verses 31 through 35. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. We come to a time of prayer and opportunity to share our joys and concerns. We pray for our companions who are traveling. We also pray for those um, who are at home recovering. It seems as though uh, part of our mission, uh, at least this week, is to maintain the, the uh, orthopedic medical community because we've uh, had several of our members. Uh, George Mitchie had knee surgery this week and Carol Seymour had uh, knee replacement and both are uh, doing well and recovering at home. Uh, George is actually in, uh, uh, not in, back in his apartment but is in the uh, rehab center there at Highland uh, Farms for, for a few days. Are there other joys or concerns that you wish to share? Yes. Uh, I wanted to do an update. Um, Evelyn got home this weekend, so Evelyn is back at home. And some have asked about food, and she's still on a restricted diet, so no food, just continue cards and letters and things. Yeah. Why was she in the um, She had a very mild stroke on her right side. Oh. But she's okay. She's okay. She's doing the work. And uh, when we asked uh, Joe about, uh, about visitors, he said that she's still um, needing, needing another booster and, and her immunity is still compromised. And so uh, for right now, the best is, is uh, just phone calls and, and cards and, and so forth. Yes, Sandy. Prayer for the Ginger family. Um, he was a longtime um, disciple in my home church and going to Lewis Ginger, Lewis Hampton Ginger. I worked with his wife for many years in Fort Stewart. So, and he was a scoundrel, but <laughs> but he was a disciple. But every day that my mother was in the nursing home, he would always peep his head in because he went to visit his mother. He said, "Do you know who I am?" <laughs> we pray for, for his yeah. family and give God thanks for his life and, and ministry. Yes, Cheryl. Um, Pray for our neighbor Tom. He is um, no family here, was in not really good medical shape, but he was been diagnosed with lung cancer and had surgery earlier this week and is not doing well. Um, he's now on a ventilator. They're going to try and take him off today, but um, just prayers for him. He's by himself. We pray for, for him and for his healing and for God's comfort. Yes. Um, my brother Bruce lives in Tampa and He's two years younger than I am. He's not doing very well mentally or physically. Uh, anyway, he's got a lot of problems. So if you could just include Bruce Woodbury in your prayers, I would certainly appreciate it. And we pray for Sandra's brother, Bruce. Yes. Now, my brother in England who has a serious case of COPD. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you know what's happening in that part of the world right now, mm -hmm. where they're having unbelievable temperatures, it's going to be 104 today. And they don't know what air conditioning is there, so uh, especially with a situation like that. 
we pray for Steve's brother and his health situation and all those suffering from climate uh, upheaval. <coughs> yes, Mary. Uh, there's a, a young lady that I work with. We started at the company on the same day 16 years ago. She was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Uh, God is holding her hand and waiting for her to come to him. My prayer, of course, is for her. Her name's Becky. Uh, I'm seeing how it's affecting the other people we work with. They're struggling with this questioning their own mortality. Mm -hmm. And I would also ask prayers for them that they are able to deal with this and find what's love with them. Thank you. And we pray for Mary's co-worker, Becky, and for her friends who are struggling to, to deal with Becky's illness. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Oh God, when the news continues to be full of anger, grief, or hatred, we are called by Christ to love one another. How hard that is sometimes, oh Lord. We can't seem to let go of our prejudices. You call us to love one another, but we put conditions on that love. It's easy to love people with whom we feel comfortable. It's more difficult to love those who are different. Teach us how to love and accept the diversity you have made. Help us treasure each other for the gifts and talents each person has. Tune our hearts to your healing message of acceptance and compassion for all. Help us to be the people of the resurrection who have been freed from the bonds of death. <clears throat> we place our lives and those of our loved ones in your care, merciful Lord. O oh God, as you made a fearful and disjointed band of disciples into your holy church, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit so that we, your body and our world, would serve you in joy and hope and thankfulness. We offer prayers for our friends who have been touched by death or illness or misfortune. Some we have named here before you out loud, others we carry in our hearts. <clears throat> We pray for our companions recovering from surgery. Comfort them with your presence, and may you continue to heal in their lives. All of these things we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever.
the scripture Cheryl read a few minutes ago, the commandment that Jesus gave us is that we are to love one another as Christ has loved us. In other words, the love is something we do. How do we do love? One of the ways is by giving our offering to God and to the work of God, believing that God will bless our gifts and through them, people will receive the love they need. So let us share this love as we offer our gifts to God. I invite you to stand and sing our doxology. Scripture reading continues from the book of Acts. What we, uh, the story that we will read here today is the end of one of the longest narratives in the book of Acts. It encompasses all of chapter 10, where we get details about Peter's vision and his interaction with Cornelius and his family. The leaders in Jerusalem hear about Peter's encounter, and they call Peter back to town to testify before a special select committee. This, what we are going to read right now from chapter 11, tells about that hearing and sums up Peter's story. The apostles and the brothers and sisters throughout Judea heard that even the Gentiles had welcomed God's word. When Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him. They accused him, you went into the house of the uncircumcised and ate with them? Step by step, Peter explained what had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying when I had a visionary experience. In my vision, I saw something like a large linen sheet being lowered from heaven by its four corners. It came all the way down to me. As I stared at it, wondering what it was, I saw four-legged animals, including wild beasts, as well as reptiles and wild birds. I heard a voice say, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I responded, Absolutely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice from heaven spoke a second time. Never consider unclean what God has made pure. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled back into heaven. At that moment, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were staying. The Spirit told me to go with them, even though they were Gentiles. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He reported to us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and summon Simon, who is known as Peter. He will tell you how you and your entire household can be saved. <laughs> when I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as the Spirit fell on us in the beginning. I remembered the Lord's words, John will baptize with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
if God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then who am I? Could I stand in God's way? Once the apostles and other believers heard this, they calmed down. They praised God and concluded, so then God has enabled Gentiles to change their hearts and lives so that they might have new life. The word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> Amy and I became disciples when we joined First Christian Church in Lynchburg, Virginia almost 30 years ago. We had been living in Lynchburg for a couple of years and had been worshiping at Peakland Baptist Church, although we didn't ever feel like we really connected there. Our real estate agent was a member of First Christian and told us a little about the congregation as we drove around town looking at houses. And then we met the pastor, David Edwards, at a coffee house where he was performing music. We both, so Amy and I both thought that we should visit First Christian sometime, but we never got around to making definite plans. And then one week the local paper ran a story about First Christian Church hosting a gay clergy couple, the Reverends Alan Harris and Craig Hoffman, and the church was inviting people to meet them and have a conversation about welcoming LGBT people in the church. I remember this was the early 1990s in Lynchburg, Virginia, a town where the largest church, Thomas Road Baptist Church, and its pastor, Jerry Falwell, were constantly making public pronouncements against liberals and feminists and gay and lesbian folks. So this invitation and event from with First Christian Church was a big deal in Lynchburg. The question of welcoming and affirming people who were gay or lesbian into the life of the church was not something that Amy and I had spent much time thinking about. At the time, I didn't have the background or training to know how to interpret what some people told me was clear condemnation of same-sex relationships in the Bible. Some of those often quoted verses taken out of context can seem pretty clear. But we were impressed that First Christian would make such a public witness we both felt that we wanted to be part of a community that was willing to struggle with hard questions and to discern how God might be calling them to reach out in new ways. Thus began a journey that led us to joining the church, becoming involved in various ways, many ways, and ultimately to my feeling a call to ordained ministry. And we joined the church in its ongoing discernment in trying to answer the question, what is the gospel message to our church as we relate to gay and lesbian Christians? An important part of that discernment process and an important part of my own journey was related to this story from Acts and how Peter was invited by God to expand his understanding of how God was working in the world and to rethink some of the long-held scripture-based rules Peter tried to live by. So let's look again at Peter's story. One day while he was praying, he had a vision. The vision of a something like a tablecloth being lowered from heaven with a great buffet spread out on it. And the buffet was made of ritually unclean animals, 
reptiles and pigs and other animals, all things that Peter knew that as a good Jew, he would never eat. God had said not to eat these animals in scripture and doing what God said was important to Peter. Observant Jews did not eat unclean animals. They also didn't eat with people who ate unclean animals. They didn't visit Gentile homes. And since the early Christians were all Jews, Peter's Christian friends didn't do those things either. And they had very good social and religious reasons not to. And Gentiles generally felt the same way about Jews. The two just didn't mix. It wasn't done. In the vision, a voice told Peter, get up, kill, and eat. But Peter refused. By no means, Lord. I've never eaten any unclean thing. But a voice said, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. What in the world did that mean? <coughs> and then the doorbell rang. Emissaries from a certain Roman military officer named Cornelius asked for Peter to go with them. Strangely, perhaps prompted by the Spirit, Peter agreed to go to the home of this Roman officer, though such a thing was hardly ever done. When they arrived at the house, Cornelius and his whole household were waiting. Cornelius explained that an angel had appeared to him, telling him to send for Peter. So Peter immediately began to tell about the good news of Jesus. Mid-sentence, Peter was interrupted by his audience, who began to praise God in a strange language, exactly the behavior of Jesus' own followers when the Holy Spirit came upon them at Pentecost. Peter was astounded. Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit? Suddenly, Peter's vision of the heavenly buffet made sense. He was not literally being told to eat lizard barbecue or pork chops or having bacon in the, with his breakfast. He was being told to accept what God had clearly blessed, though it ran contrary to everything he believed. So Peter asked, can anyone withhold water from these people to whom God has already given the Holy Spirit? And so, Gentiles, non-Jews, who were not circumcised and who broke God's law by eating unclean animals, Gentiles, of all people, were baptized as followers of Jesus. Peter's Christian friends back in Jerusalem got wind of it. Peter was doing, what was Peter doing talking to these people? What was he doing eating with them, much less baptizing them? So they called him to explain. Peter told them what had happened and concluded, if then God gave them the same gift that God gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Peter's friends heard him and concluded, then God has given to the Gentiles even to the Gentiles, the repentance that leads to life. You can almost hear the disbelief in their voices. That conversation was not the end of the debate about whether non-Jews could belong in the Christian church. The question of who is in and who is out in the church has never gone completely away. But on that day, when Jesus' first followers heard the story of Cornelius and Peter, they opened the door a little wider because they learned that God accepted people whom they had had no qualms in rejecting. 
in one sense, this story is ancient history. It is the explanation of how a Jewish sect came to be a multi-ethnic movement spreading out around the Mediterranean world. But it's not just a piece of ancient history. It's also our story, a story that guides us as we think about who is in and who is out. First, to the church, to all the insiders, to all those who, like Peter, have the power to keep people out, or make them feel excluded and unwelcome. This story pushes us to widen our embrace of those we consider outsiders. What God has made clean, we must not call profane. Those whom God has accepted, we must not reject. 2,000 years ago, the church learned to open its arms to people whose customs and behaviors were previously seemed repugnant to them. It learned that lesson then, and it keeps on learning it. Because we're very good at drawing distinctions between people to decide who gets in and who gets out. We might draw distinctions along national or political boundaries, or along ethnic or racial lines or along the fault lines of sexual or gender identity, or along the boundaries of age or experience. We might even cite scripture, as Peter originally did. But this story calls out to us with Peter's discovery, God shows no partiality. In God's house, there is room for everyone. And we were not put here to be doorkeepers, but to be servants. But the story of Cornelius isn't just a story for those who are insiders. It's also for a story for those who feel like outsiders. Because this isn't just Peter's story, it's also Cornelius' story. How must Cornelius have felt? He, a Roman centurion, calling for a Jewish man he'd never met. He must have wondered whether his ethnicity and customs would be so offensive that they would turn Peter away. So this is an outsider's story. And guess what? That's every one of us. I'm sure that every one of us has felt like an outsider at some time or another, wondering if we would be welcomed or accepted. I was not raised a disciple of Christ, you might say. Or, I don't know the Bible very well. Or, I'm more conservative than most people in the congregation. Or, I'm more liberal than most people here. Or, I never went to college. I'm divorced. I'm gay. I have a disability, and so on. All reasons why we might feel like outsiders, wondering if we would belong. But there's another way to look at our differences. Cornelius, the outsider to the Christian movement, sent for Peter, and then he praised God and asked for baptism. Cornelius' conversion was a direct challenge to the early Christian community's exclusivity. An outsider brought change to the very heart of the Christian faith. The point is, the early Christians needed Cornelius. They needed him to be himself, different as he was so that they could learn that God shows no favoritism. Cornelius, the outsider, was a gift to the church. So, you feel like you're not like the rest of us, 
in some way. Good. We need you. We need to hear your voice. We need to see the world through your eyes. You belong here not because you're like all the rest, but because you are yourself, and God has called you here. The Apostle Paul liked to describe the church as being one big body, the body of Christ in the world. Some of us are like hands, he said. Some are like feet. Some are like eyes or ears. And, Paul said, the ear can't say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. Likewise, he said, the eye can't say to the hand, you're not like me, I don't need you. Just as every body part fits into a beautiful whole, every person in the community is necessary. Being different from others does not mean you don't belong. It means you matter more than ever. If you feel like an outsider in this place or somewhere else, then you are a gift. You were invited here by Christ, and we all need you. In the end, each of us is both an outsider and an insider. We are outsiders because no, none of us deserve to be here. We are all here in this community of grace by God's grace. And we need to hear others say that we are welcome. For we are also insiders. We are insiders because we have been drawn into the household of God and invited to Christ's table to share the gifts that only we can share with others. And as insiders, each of us has been given the task of extending welcome to the rest. We are all outsiders and all insiders, and we all share this truth. All people are acceptable and fit for God's love and grace. Amen. As I have loved you, Jesus said. How is it that Jesus has loved us? He loved us by accepting us as we are, without distinction. The bread and the cup at this table remind us of how Jesus loved us. We can't earn our place at this table, but Jesus invites us anyway. So come to the table. This is how he loved us. Let us join in singing, Who is my mother? Who is my brother? <laughs> Thank you.
Jesus was having supper with his friends, his disciples, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this bread represents my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus also took the cup, and after blessing it, he poured it and gave it to them, saying, This cup represents the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we pray? Gracious God, we come with Christians here and those at home to share and celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so with joy we take the feast of bread and cup before us, knowing this meal is given to us in remembrance of Jesus our Lord. The one who gave his life is seen now in the bread. The one that gave his blood seen in the cup, so we could be forgiven of our sins and claimed by God the Father as children in Jesus' name. Thank you for this eternal gift. And we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. salvation. As often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we remember the Lord's life, death, and resurrection and proclaim his ongoing presence with us. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our hymn of invitation, and we extend an invitation first to those who are, might be seeking a church home and wish to become a part of this community of faith, we would welcome you and invite you to come forward as we sing our hymn together. But the invitation is also to each one of us. You are invited to go out into the community this week looking for ways that you can welcome others and make them feel acceptable and loved. Let us sing Diverse in Culture, Nation, Race. <laughs>
Before the benediction, we have a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Y'all know I usually make librarian announcements. This announcement is not about our little church library, but the public library in Black Mountain is turning 100 this year. And tomorrow night, there's an interesting program presented by a man, I can't remember his name at all, <laughs> starting at 5.30, which will uh, explain the entire history of the Black Mountain Library. There'll be some refreshments, and um, it should be fun. Come and listen. You don't have to register. It's free. Come, and I'll be there. So I'll meet you at the door. Thank you, Sandra. And now may the love of God be in your hearts, your minds, and your spirits as we go forth into God's world. Amen. Don't forget next Sunday afternoon from 2 to 4 at Lake Tomahawk. Oh,